We've got a special 40 day. Nick Mingione joins us. He is Kentucky's baseball coach, entering an exciting new season with a lot of new faces. We'll go through. Nick, thanks for joining us this morning. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Good morning. Let's rewind to last year. Your team had a, a nice season. You made a nice run in the tournament. My goodness, the, the schedule was brutal. You played, what was it, 33 of your 60-something games against RPI top 50 teams, almost all those in the top 25. Um, I thought you had a case to to make the NCAA tournament, and honestly, I wonder if some teams that, that were there as at-large as would have survived your schedule. Um, just recap that, and th did you feel like you deserved to be there? Well, I can tell you this. You know, we finished really strong. And yeah. as you know, you know, life in this league is you have to have a complete resume and you got to, you know, each team is going to go through every season. You'll have your ups and downs and you try to minimize those. And but we played really well late. You know, we went nine and six in our last 15 SEC games. And as you know, Chris, like, you know, that is a, a really high number. But, you yeah. know, the committee looks at the whole schedule and they deem that maybe we didn't quite have the RPI or whatever, but I, you know, I give a lot of credit to Ole Miss. It just shows you the strength mm -hmm. of our league. I mean, the ninth, yeah, the last team, the ninth team in our league gets in one of the last teams to get in a tournament and they can win a national championship. And, you know, I remember being at Mississippi state and we finished fifth in 2013 and we played for the national championship. So mm -hmm. I'm not surprised having been in this league for 16 years, but um, you know, the nine and six was a strong start and definitely one that we need to build on this year. Yeah, I, I think what Ole Miss did actually strengthen your case, but you, you can't back go back and, and do it over. But this year, uh, man, I'm looking at your roster. Your lineup is almost going to be entirely new. You really killed it in the portal. You got a lot of high on base guys, some guys that had showed some power. Tell us a little bit about your lineup this year. Well, you 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 nailed it, Chris. You know, obviously we had you know lost quite a few guys to either graduation and a bunch of those guys signed professionally, which is really neat as a coach, you know, to help them get the opportunity to go chase their dreams and goals of, you know, playing in the major league. So, but with that came a lot of, you know, new faces. So, you know, just going through, you know, some of the guys, you know, we brought in a catcher by the name of Chase Danke from Minnesota who had a nice career there. Um, Hunter Gillum has played first base for us. He's at this point, he's won the first base job. He's from Longwood, two-time captain. And then we brought quite a few infielders, you know, Isaiah Byers from University of North Florida, Grant Smith from Incarnate Word, um, Ryder Giles, who was at ECU, who's mm -hmm. uh, obviously can pitch too. You guys remember him. He pitched on their super regional team, even pitched on Friday nights. And, you know, Pat Herrera from Northwestern, all conference players. So, and then any the outfield, Kendall Yule, Jackson Gray, and Ryan Walshman added, you know, three outfielders there with some experience, have done, you know, a lot of good things in college baseball. And you know this, but the portal is just, you know, provided us an opportunity to just maybe not be young all the time. And, yeah. you know, we've spent a lot of time this offseason talking about the guys in the portal, but we also have some guys in our program that have gotten dramatically better as well. So they're going to have the opportunity to be everyday players. So um, positionally, it's definitely helped. Has your recruiting philosophy changed with the portal? I, I know you're the northernmost SEC team, which, which probably comes with some advantages and maybe some challenges. Um, I hear the phrase getting old a lot in this league, and you've seen some teams that were old that have done really well, Tennessee and A&M from last year being two. Is that a philosophy that you're going to more or less pursue as long as the rules are the way they are? Well, you know, our – ultimate goal will always to be bringing in the high profile high school players. You know, I think yeah. anytime you could have guys in your program for two, three, four years, you know, even if they mm -hmm. end up redshirting and, you know, they end up not getting drafted and they're in your program for five years, to me, that is where the base and the core of our recruiting should start. But the portal does add opportunities for guys. You know, sometimes you, you don't know and you can't see you know, the future. And you don't know maybe two, three, four years in advance of where those areas that you might need to address are until yeah. the season's over and you go through it. So um, our core philosophy will be to continue to recruit the high level high school student athlete, but then at the same time, be able to use the portal accordingly. How big of a challenge is that? And, and how do you prepare for that? Because there's so many names in the portal. Uh, I mean, it, and it, you're, you're just getting done with the season. You're, you're dealing mm. with summer ball mm. and, and draft. I'm like, I can't even imagine what being 
an SEC coach is like these days with all those challenges. Don't remind me, okay? No, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, a lot of times us as coaches, we were like the boys of the summer. And, yeah. you know, 10 years ago, you're getting out and the season ends and hopefully it's at the end of June in Omaha. And if not, it's in a super or a regional, whatever. And next thing you know, like you are literally hitting the road recruiting. And, you know, when I was a recruiting coordinator, I remember being gone at one point, like 28 straight days of just like yeah. gone. And you're sitting at ballparks and you're watching games and tournaments. Well, the portals added a new layer to this, you yeah. know, to where you're spending a little bit more time in front of your computer. And you're watching and you're seeing names pop up and you're studying and you're watching video. And mm -hmm. so, you know, the time has kind of shifted a little bit. You're still at tournaments. You're still out and about. But at the same time, you're got to keep tabs and you got to be organized as it relates to the transfer portal. Well, and not not that just too, but it's obviously managing scholarships as, as oh. baseball fans. No, you don't get the like I, I just sit and wonder, like, how do you guys do what you do and, and get any sleep these days? You know, it's it's hard, but I think it's yeah. also a reason why you have seen over time, you have seen baseball coaches become athletic directors uh -huh. because you're doing a lot of the same stuff. Not all of it. And I'm not an athletic director, so I don't claim to know everything that they're doing. But you want to talk about managing budgets. You want to talk about having to have a, a vision and a plan looking forward. You want to talk about having to get the right people in the right spots. You want to have to talk about having difficult conversations. You want to talk yeah. about, you know, all the things that go into college athletics, you know, and how to handle scholarships and rosters and things like that. I believe it helps prepare you to do a lot of things in college athletics. And uh, it's definitely a, a job where it's forever changing and you got to keep adjusting, as you know, but uh, it's actually a fun one, too. Well, and a, and a guy you know well, and John Cohen uh, made made just that leap. Oh yeah, the thing about John Cohen, Ray Tanner, Skip Bertman. I mean, yeah. there's three right there that have become athletic directors. So um, there's definitely a track record of that. What are your transfers? I want to ask you about Jackson Gray from Western Kentucky. The stat line last year wasn't great. Two years ago was really good. I'm presuming there was an injury or, or something there with him. Um, you know, I don't know if it's so much an injury. I mean, he got, you know, quite a few have batch, you know, there could have been something there, but you know, sometimes just a chain of scenery is good yeah. too, you know, and for some guys having different coaches and being a part of different programs could be a good thing, you know, and I think if you look at some of the guys in our league last year, um, not only in our program, I mean, you look at some of our guys, a guy like Tyler Guilfoyle, he's a first team, all yeah. sec reliever. And he has better numbers here than he did at his previous school. Same thing yeah. with a guy like Sean Harney. You know what I mean? The conference player of the year last year down at Auburn. I mean, he had better numbers at Auburn than he did at his previous institution. So, you know, um, sometimes the chain of scenery could be good and it could be beneficial for the player. And I think that would be the case in Jackson's case as well. Yeah, I thought Tyler Guilfoyle, who, who played in our backyard at Lipscomb, I thought he was about the most underrated pitcher in your league last year he was just so good for you do you do you have another one of those this year ah, let's hope I mean we better have a couple <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no but we do you know we brought in we brought in four guys at a transfer portal you know arms that we're going to count on a guy like Seth Chavez who has an opportunity to pitch on the back yeah. end of the game for us and when it matters Ryder Giles is one of those guys Zach Kais is a transfer from um, Missouri and then Logan Martin is from a uh, division three Swanee and uh, he threw as good as anybody we had in the fall. So um, Porter was good for us as far as it, and as it relates to pitching as well. Yeah, Heiss was a kid who's, who's very talented, was at Missouri, didn't pitch a year ago. What, what kind of year are you looking for from him? And is, is he one of your rotation guys to start the year? Because I believe he pitched out of the rotation in 2020 and won at Missouri, if I remember correctly. You did. You know, matter of fact, when we played him, he was our Sunday starter, and uh, he pitched yeah. here at Kentucky Proud Park. So um, he had gotten injured while he was at Missouri, and uh, he had been rehabbing that injury and um, had a couple, you know, had a little bit of a setback this fall so he did not throw as much as you know he wanted to but he's back healthy now so in a lot of ways you know these next couple of weeks leading up to the season and then even into the season will be you know a good opportunity for us to still keep evaluating him and him learning and growing but uh, as far as him being in rotation you know that's not been decided at this point but hey we might look up in a couple of weeks and he's there who knows he's that talented and he does have the experience as you mentioned who's in the running for your rotation spots at the moment um well, 
you know, that's a, a tough question because a guy yeah. by the name of Darren Williams, uh, you know, he was yeah. arguably one of our best pitchers last year, and uh, he went down with an injury. He's back. He's healthy. He's been cleared. He's throwing. Got a chance to throw this past weekend live to his teammates and in an actual scrimmage. So uh, that was good for him. But, you know, just seeing how he progresses over these next couple of weeks will really ultimately help determine, you know, what our rotation will look like. A guy like Logan Martin threw exceptionally well in the fall. He's definitely, you know, at this point, one of the guys that is a leaning, you know, re returner from the fall, I guess, you know, that is could be in there. And then a guy like Tyler Bosma, who threw on the weekends yeah. for us last year. So and we got a handful of other guys that are throwing the ball extremely well. But, you know, how these next three or four weeks shape up and, you know, we'll determine our full rotation. But, you know, those guys I mentioned, along with a couple others, are in the running as well. And Seth Chavez, you mentioned him earlier. That mm -hmm. what, at ETSU, I guess he closed for them a year ago or two years ago. Um, yeah. I, I think he didn't pitch last year, but two years ago, I believe he struck out 40 and 22 innings, something like that. But what kind of pitch mix does he have? What kind of year are you looking from him? And, and what maybe kind of role does he fill for you this year? Well, at this point, he's going to pitch in the back end of the game, you know, so yeah. – um, whether that's the closer, whether that's the seventh, eighth, ninth inning guy, the bottom line is, as of right now, he'll be in there at some point when it matters. And um, he's got a really good fastball. I mean, it rides. He's got a really good breaking ball. Um, he is uber, uber competitive. And um, so he's come back. He had gotten injured at his previous institution and He's fully recovered now, and it's good to see him throwing the ball with some velocity. So he's going to pitch somewhere in the back end of the game for us. You do have several guys back, I think, from a year ago that, that pitched significant innings. Uh, Hagenal, Cotto, yes. Zach Lee, some guys like that. What are you looking for from, from those returning guys this year? Yeah, you mentioned a couple guys, you know, in, in Ryan and then Strick is a guy. Austin Strickland's yeah. back. He threw a ton. Seth Logue threw some. Uh, Mason Moore through some. We got a redshirt freshman in Tyler Howe that's thrown the ball exceptionally well. Um, so, you know, those guys, a, as you know, I, I love the saying, same name, different player, and they all yeah. have gotten better. Um, we have a guy in Travis Smith that um, had to have Tommy John out of high school, and uh, so he rehabbed last year. He's back, and um, he's thrown the ball exceptionally well. So we got quite a few guys that even went out this summer. A lot of those guys I mentioned went out and had good summers and logged a couple extra innings so they could be prepared for the season. So we're going to count and use on all those guys we mentioned. They're going to play a role of some sort. Your schedule this year, I think I think you start the year on the road. Uh, you play some familiar faces, I think, to start. What, what are you looking for in the pre-conference portion before you get into the meat grinder of the league? Well, I think if you look at our, our schedule, um, I was reading an article the other day, someone pointed out to me that out of all the teams in our league, our I guess our schedule has the highest winning percentage non-conference hmm. opponents out of anyone. Um, so we open up at Elon. As you know, they throw a ton of strikes. They're a really good team. And then our weekends, you know, when you sit there and you start looking at our weekends with Wright State, Indiana State, and Southern Illinois, yeah. I mean, those are three um, – really good opponents, you know, as I mentioned with Elon already. So when you look at those four as a whole, we feel really good about that. And then you look at our non-conference schedule as well as some of the teams that we've added for some of our midweek games. So it's definitely a challenging schedule, but one that we believe will, at the end of the day, if we do what we're supposed to and play like we're we're capable, I think it's going to be one that's going to really help us RPI-wise. So, And then, of course, you know what our league's going to do, the RPI yeah. as well. So, Yeah. Uh, Nick, as we wrap it up here, I feel like we, we hit a lot of topics. Anything of note that with your team or, or players that, that I didn't get to that people should be talking about? You know, um, obviously, you know, the players are, they're going to, their play is going to speak for themselves, but you know, I've just, I really enjoy being around this group. I mean, yeah. you know, obviously every team's totally different, but, um, they've just done everything that we've asked and they've done it at a high level, you know? Even this fall, our team GPA was a 3.5 team GPA. Wow. We had 17 guys with a 3.75 or higher. They We gave hundreds of hours to the community, you know, able to, mm. to give back. Um, they just, they're tough, they're competitive, and they want to win. And I've just enjoyed being around them, you know. And uh, as you know, um, sometimes when you, 
you bring in some new people. You just don't know. It's kind of like a recipe, right? I mean, yeah. You start adding a couple of different ingredients. You don't know how they're all going to blend and and mesh and and taste well. But uh, so far, we feel like we laid a good foundation in the fall. And um, I've just appreciated the way they've gone about their business, the maturity, the teammates they've been, um, how committed they've been to Kentucky, and they want to help us win. Yeah. And you know, so I'm looking forward to going through the season with them. Hey, Nick, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and just so people know, we're doing this right at the end of January. So if there's a storyline or something we didn't cover that that happens in February, uh, that's what went on here. But uh, thank you so much for joining us, and best of luck to you this season. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Go Cats.